just more juicy than that. Okay, no, I'm serious. I, I, I hear good things, but I would like you to participate in this class as well. It is, um, it's quite exciting if it's not only me who does the talking. So if you have anything to add, but what we have to do today is I want to get on with a part of the course where we talk about the application of the Bill of Rights. Now remember we asked a number of questions. We said, does the Bill of Rights apply? How does it apply? Who does it bind? Who benefits? Where does it apply? For what time period does it apply? Do you remember that? Okay. Then we've looked at the how it applies. We've looked at the direct method, and we said, if we talk about direct application, what are we talking about? What is, what is the methodology that we apply? We rely on what? A constitutional right. To challenge the validity of law, whether it is statute, or common law, or customary law, or whatever the case may be. The remedy, what is the source of our remedy? The Constitution. <laughs> and when in doubt and you don't know which case is a good example, go back to the old favorite, which is all together now, Mark Agnani. So, <laughs> I have seen students use Mark Agnani for authority in company law, in the law of negotiable instruments, in, in private law, in public law, in criminal law, in procedural law. Professor Mark is basically just a private case. But, um, so, this is really the one time where it is a authority. Okay, but now, we are talking about indirect application of the Bill of Rights. And that's what we want to talk about today. Remind me, where do we place our reliance? Oh, do I have to count you in? On the common law or? Yes. And we look at the common law statute, how? Through the values. So the lenses that we put on, we put on our spectacles, our constitutional spectacles. We look at the rights in the common law, in the statute, through the lens of the values of the constitution. And our remedy is sourced where? In the statute or the common law. Okay, if you have that distinction down to a pat, you've got quite a bit, big part of this course down to a pat. What I want to do I'm not even upset because I'm just so relieved that it's not me. <laughs> because that's that wicked sound that wakes me up a bit. <laughs> okay. So we want to talk about indirect application of the Bill of Rights. And what is very important here is when do we do this? When do we consider indirect application? Anyone have an idea? We start here. So what we do is, when someone comes to you with a problem and they say to you, I think my problem has some sort of constitutional angle. Rather than trying to go directly for direct application, you try to find a solution in the common law or in legislation to solve the person's problem. Why is that important? Because when the court makes a declaration of invalidity, we have a gap in our law. And who's the primary lawgiver? Parliament. So if Parliament sits on its hands and it doesn't actually legislate in that particular area, we have a gap in the law. So it's very important that when we look at the Constitution and look to infuse all the parts of our law with the Constitution, we start with indirect application. So indirect application precedes direct application. But sometimes it is so that the law is just blatantly, completely, and utterly unconstitutional. And then you leave it. Because then you know the only option you have here is a declaration of invalidity sourced in the Constitution. But what I want to do today is I want to look at examples. And these examples require case law reading. I'm going to go through statutes, and I'm 
stress that we will be able to start with the common law today. But there are cases that you have to read in order to understand. Because if you don't read the cases, you won't understand how the law applies indirectly, or how the Constitution, rather, applies indirectly in the particular instance. But let's look, just to remind ourselves, at the theory. The Constitution binds all law. That's section 2. Section 8.1 repeats that, all law. Section 39.2 and section 173 are important in this instance. When interpreting any legislation, so what do we know here? The Constitution says, when we look at legislation, the common law or customary law, we must promote the spirit, purpose, and object of the Bill of Rights. That's section 39.2. So the effect thereof of is rather than strike the law down, put your constitutional spectacles on, use the values of the Constitution, and infuse the law, the statute, or the common law, with the values of the Constitution. So that is the injunction that we get from Section 39.2. Now, I'm not going to try and com compare that at this point in time to 8.2 and 8.3. But I want you to make a little note that when we're done with this, go back to 8.2 and 8.3 and ask yourself, how is 8.2 and 8.3 different? Okay, but let's leave that for the moment. Importantly, as I said earlier on, we have to consider this before we consider direct application of the Bill of Rights. Okay, clear. Can we turn to the example? First of all, let's look at the theory of indirect application of the Bill of Rights, and then we're going to look at two or three cases of So what is the effect of the Bill of Rights on the law as it is set out in statute? Now we know, section 39.2 says, when interpreting legislation, every court tribunal or forum must further the spirit, purpose, and object of the Bill of Rights. Okay? We know that. That's the injunction. Now, what the court has told us is that where we are confronted with two possible interpretations of a statute, one that is constitutionally compatible and one that is constitutionally incompatible, we opt for the option that is constitutionally compatible. But that doesn't mean that the court can read whatever it wants to read in the text of the particular statute. The text must be reasonably, or the reading down in conformity with the Constitution, must be reasonably possible. So that it must not be an unduly strange interpretation of the provision. Because if you come to a provision where you read red as blue, or child as adult, then clearly you are not reading down. What you are actually doing is you are finding an inconsistency and you're no longer relying on the remedy as it is set out in the legislation. Okay, so let's go through that again. You have two options, and when we talk about the next case, you will understand it. You have two options. You can interpret legislation in line with the Constitution, or there's another reading of the particularly, or the exact same provision, but that leads to an inconsistency. But we want to avoid an inconsistency because an inconsistency creates a vacuum in the law. Therefore, we read down the law, the statute, in a manner that is compatible with the values and the framework of values set out in the Constitution. So, what we're trying to do is not to legislate from the bench. So the court, rather than saying, okay, let me take my red pen and let me scratch out words and write in new words to provide a remedy, let me rather say, I can read this provision to be in consonance with the Constitution. It doesn't conflict with the Constitution if I assign this particular meaning to it. And the case law illustrates this better. So let's go to two of the, uh, of the cases. I'm going to start with... Nell versus LaRue. Because Nell versus LaRue is probably one of the locus classicus in relation to the protection, the indirect application of the Bill of Rights. Now, if you are a person with information about a crime, so I am a journalist.
Lebanon, for example. I have information about the commission of a crime. Section 205 of the CPA Criminal Procedure Act. CPA Criminal Procedure Act. Read with section 189 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Leads to the following interpretation, or leads to the following. A person who is likely to give material or relevant information as to an alleged offence and who will not furnish such information in the ordinary course may be required by a judicial officer to appear before him for the examination by a prosecutor. If a person furnishes such information, the obligation falls away. If a person refuses to furnish such information without a just excuse, Section 189 allows for the imprisonment of the person for up to two years. Can you hear that? That's quite drastic. So I have someone, I know something about the commission of a crime. Not me, but I know someone has committed a crime. Okay? So I refuse to give information to the police about this. In terms of Section 205, a magistrate may summon me to appear before him where a prosecutor will question me about the alleged offence. If I say, I'm not talking to you, speak to the hand, and I don't give a just excuse, the magistrate can say, well, thank you for playing two years in prison. It's quite harsh. Okay? So in this particular case, this was the set of facts. Someone had information, the person didn't want to provide the information, and the court said, how can we read this provision to be in line with the Constitution? Is it possible or not? But obviously for that, the court had to stand a little bit back and say, okay, what is this? What is this mechanism? It's an evidence-gathering mechanism that is internationally recognized. Now, the interesting thing in South Africa is we don't have specific protection for journalists. In many other countries, there is specific protection for journalists. So if you are a journalist in this position, Section 205 and 189 apply, will apply to you. And you can actually sit and think about the questions that were posed for two years until you're ready to answer. Okay? So, the court says... The examinee carries the key to the prison in his pocket. If you provide the information, well, then the obligation falls away. But if you do not provide the information without a just excuse, and that is without the just cause, rather, not excuse, without a just cause, then you are liable to go to prison. So, in the case, the section was challenged on a whole host of bases. Challenge on the basis of equality, privacy, freedom of expression, the right of an accused person to be uh, presumed innocent, the infringement of the right to a fair trial. And the court said, is it possible to read this section in a manner that is constitutionally compatible? Can we make sense of section 205, read with 189, to provide a constitutionally valid way of gathering? Now, the basis of challenge, as I said, the court said in the first instance, this person is, is not an accused person, so they don't have the rights of an accused person as set up in the Constitution. But the court said, let's look very carefully at the circumstances under which the person does not have to answer the questions. The person does not have to answer the questions if they have a just excuse. So if I have a just excuse, <laughs> and I've been the journalist or the person summoned to appear before the magistrate to be questioned, and I say, I'm terribly sorry, I can't answer that question because I will be incriminating myself. They have to let me go. Because I have a just excuse. So the court relied on its previous precedent in this regard and said, just excuse can be read in line with a sufficient cause. And sufficient cause in Bernstein versus Fester, the court said, is when answering the question would result in the infringement of the fundamental rights of an examiner. So if I go to the court as, a, as an examinee, 
and I have questions about what I know about an alleged offence. And I say, okay, I can answer that question, it was a blue car. But I can't answer that question, because if I answer that question, I stand to infringe my fundamental rights, or, ex or put them at risk. And the court says, that means that it is possible to read section 205 in a manner that is constitutionally consonant. It is not necessary to strike section 205 down. Because section 205 can be read to, uh, to mean that it would exist, just excuse would exist, when answering the question would result in the infringement of the examiner's rights. Does that make sense? Everyone. So you could read it to say, that is a little bit harsh. It is so harsh, we cannot say that particular section. And it's an unconstitutional section. Or you can say, well, let's look at the common law, or sorry, the statute law. We put on our constitutional spectacles and we say, oh well, it will be compatible with a constitution if we read it in a particular way. So the court attaches a particular interpretation to the right through the lens of the constitution. But obviously, as I said earlier on, there are limits to this because the court can't read things into a statute if that statute is explicitly contrary to what is constitutionally compatible. Okay, and then I want to talk about governor, business minister, and safety and security. This is a relatively old case. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, because it really tells us beautifully, if I can find my governor, okay. it tells us really beautifully how indirect applications of the law right will operate. Now, any of you familiar with section 49.1 of the Criminal Procedure? Are we still on the Criminal Procedure? Section 49 is that section of the Constitution that allows for the use of deadly force by a police officer. But in which circumstances may a police officer use deadly force? Now, section 49 is all the police officer use deadly force. Section 49 says the following. The use of force in affecting arrest. <coughs> if a person authorized under this act to arrest or to assist in arresting another attempts to arrest such a person and such a person resists the attempt and cannot be arrested without the use of force or please when it is clear that an attempt to arrest him is being made or resist such an attempt and please the arrest and the person authorized may in order to effect the arrest use such force as may be necessary in the circumstances, as it may be reasonably necessary in the circumstances, to overcome the resistance and to prevent the person concerned from being Okay. So in other words, if you are in the presence of a police officer and the police officer says, I'm arresting you on charges of X, Y, and Z, and you resist the arrest, or you try to run away, the police officer may use such force as in the circumstances may be reasonably necessary to overcome the resistance, including the use of deadly force. Now, in this case, a 70-year-old boy, together with his friends, and that is why your parents warned you against force, um, they were hanging out at a mall. This is 1995. And as they were walking around, we saw some other friends, and one of the friends had a key to a car that he had stolen, he got into the car, stole the car, drove off in the car, and the guy was driving a little bit erratically, he swallowed them, they jumped out of the car, they ran away, the police man shot, fired a shot into the embankment, fired another shot, aiming at the leg, hit him in the spine, and he ended up paraplegic. So, the question was, the family claimed damages from the police for the excessive use of force. So the question was, what, how can we make sense of Section 49? How does it allow the use of force? And is Section 49 unconstitutional in that it says, may use force that is reasonably necessary in the circumstances to over, uh, to over come the resistance, yeah, to overcome the resistance and prevent the person from being. So 
So the court had to examine this very carefully. Now, in this particular instance, the court said, paragraph 10, and it refers to uh, the investigating director's uh, serious economic offense. All statutes must be interpreted through the prism of the Bill of Rights. And then, paragraph 11, it tells us how the court must find this balance. Magistrates and judges must examine the object for the purport of the act and or the section under consideration. Examine the ambit of the meaning of the rights by, protected by the Constitution. Ascertain whether it is reasonably possible to interpret the act or the section in a manner that conforms with the Constitution. If such an interpretation is possible, to give effect to it. If it's not possible, declare it unconstitutional. So here we have the full recipe in paragraph 11 as to how we have to go about it. So we look at the statute. We look at why is the statute enacted? Why do we have section 49? Then we look at the rights set out in the Constitution that is affected by section 49. And then we ask ourselves, is it possible to read this section in a manner that is constitutionally possible? And the court says the object and the purport of section 149, 1 and 2 are obvious. It is fundamentally to protect the safety and security of all persons. The state has a duty to preserve the criminal justice system's effectiveness and deter crime. And a failure by the state will be an omission of its duty. The threshold requirement laid down in section 41 49 until it is has been interpreted now has been extremely low. It does not expressly qualify the nature and the extent of the force that may be used. So there's nothing in section 49 that says under which circumstances you may use deadly force. So this is important that the court then says proportionality is something that is inherent in the constitution. And this is from paragraph 16 onwards. So the court says one has to look, and particularly paragraph 21. I'm of the view that in giving effect to section 49.1 and in applying the constitutional standard of reasonableness, the existing and narrow test of proportionality between the seriousness of the relevant offense and the use and the force used should be expanded to include a consideration of proportionality. <coughs> So what is important here is that we see that the judge says, if someone is accused of fraud, fraud you don't necessarily commit with any weapon, okay? And I'm arrested on a charge of fraud and I run away. The force that may be used may, must be commensurate to the crime. I'm not going to kill someone necessarily if I run away if I'm convicted or charged with fraud. But there must be proportionality between the two. So if I'm running away and turning around and shooting at the police and they shoot me and they kill me, well, then I have a coming to me. But if I am not posing a threat, so there must be proportionality between the two. And the court goes on to say that we should read the section in line with the Constitution. Paragraph 23. Can section 49 of the act reasonably be interpreted to encompass the approach discussed above? I am of the view that it is eminently possible. The exception includes the test for reasonable necessity. There must be proportionality between the force and the crime committed. And that is very important. So the court gives an extensive interpretation of section 49 to show that it is not necessary to strike section 49 down. Because we can read through the Constitution the requirement of proportionality into Section 49. So if I steal a lunch bar, I don't have to be killed when I run away. <laughs> but if I run away from the scene of a murder, and there is a reasonable proportional expectation that I could kill someone else, Fleeing is not necessarily the only answer. People sometimes resist arrest. And then you would see the police sometimes, I mean, hiking is worse. Sorry, sorry, I, I appreciate this is, but hell, they work roughly. So, um, but it is important that there must be proportionality.
proportionality between the extent of the crime and the force used in the particular instance. Now, what is interesting in this particular instance is that the Supreme Court of Appeal held that the force used by the police officer in arresting this young man, that that was excessive. And that he should have seen that he's a young person, that uh, he was negligent, and the police was held liable for the damages that he had suffered. But I mean, obviously, this will depend on the circumstances of the particular case. So each case will be considered on its own. But the important thing that we have to bear in mind is that it must be reasonably possible. Blue cannot be red to mean red. That does not work. Blue cannot be red to mean yellow. So if you have to, the words must be reasonably capable of the meaning that you give to them. And the words in just excuse and the words used in section 49 requires that proportionality that the court says is in line with the provisions of the Constitution. Okay. Question. Because I think what this takes us now to a case, this takes us to the copy. Now I want you to make sure with, re with re reference to these two cases that you understand how, in certain circumstances, one can look at the statute, you can say, I can read it in this way or in that way, but if I read it in this way, it's constitutionally compatible. I'm choosing this way. But you cannot read words to mean the opposite of what they mean. The words must be reasonably capable of the interpretation of science. Okay. Now the common law is a little bit more complex. is that where the common law, and remember this Bill of Rights binds all law, and when interpreting legislation, the common law first person is obviously the Bill of Rights must be given effect. So what this requires is the development of the common law in line with the spirit purpose and objects of the Bill of Rights in, as in section 39. So when it comes to a common law provision, you look at the common law provision, but you put your constitutional spectacles on, you look through the valley of, through, sorry, through the lens of the values in the Constitution. If you apply the common law, find your remedy in the common law, because we're now at the common law, to interpret the common law in, a, in line with the provisions of the Bill of Rights. Now, when we talk about this, it's quite important to bear in mind that high courts or higher courts bind the decisions of lower courts. So where you have, for example, the Supreme Court of Appeal making a particular interpretation or granting a particular interpretation of common law concepts, the High Court is bound by that. So we have to bear that in mind when we talk about the doctrine of precedent, when we talk about development of the common law in line with the provisions of the Court of Rights. Obviously, when it comes to magistrates' courts, they have to follow the interpretation that has been set out or adopted by the High Court. But when we have the common law provisions, very often, you will recall, we talk about things like the bone amore. We talk about the standard to determine unlawfulness is determined with reference to the convic legal convictions of the people in society. You remember what the common law is? For those who forgot, the common law of dealings, for example, tells us about under which circumstances can someone claim damages from someone else. Okay? Now, can we read or rather develop common law in a manner that gives effect to the constitutional values. And that is the question that we need to try and answer when we talk about the effect of the Bill of Rights or the indirect application of the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. <coughs> I'm going to talk about one case and I think I want to start really very much at the beginning of this case because I think you need to get your feet around the principles of the law of dealing. Because if you don't understand the principles of the law of dealing here, you're going to run into trouble. But, Karma Shell versus Minister of Safety and Security, which is a 2001 constitutional court case. I want you to go and read the case. We only meet each other next week, Friday. Yeah, I'm terribly sorry to ruin your plan last weekend, but we 
will be carrying on. And the register will be circulating. So, Carmichael versus Minister of Safety and Security and another. This is a claim for damages under the common law. So the law of dealing says, if I, in an unlawful, unintentional, or an unlawful, and negligent way, cause you damages, I'm liable to make good on that damages, if you can prove that the damages were caused by me. So that is the case here, a claim for damages, under the common law. Now, what is important to bear in mind here is the following. Miss <laughs> Carmichael visited a friend in a little village outside Naisna. And while she was at this friend's house, waiting for the friend to arrive, she opened the door and she found inside the house a guy called Francho Pizia, who proceeded to brutally attack her. He broke her arm, he hit her with a pickaxe, he um, stabbed her with a knife in the breastbone so that it buckled. I mean, it, look, you can read the judgment to see the extent of the trauma and the physical harm that he inflicted upon her. She managed to get away, but she then said, let's just take a step back. Francia Kutsia, at the time that he attacked her, was out on his own recognizance in society, after it was alleged that he had raped a woman. So he arrived, um, or sorry, he has a troubled childhood. And you can read all about his troubled childhood in the judgment. But among other things, he at one point was convicted of indecency assaulting a, a, a relative or a, an acquaintance. <coughs> He was given a sentence of imprisonment, which was suspended, which meant he, he could stay out, but all of that had passed. And then on the second occasion, he offered to walk a, a woman home after a party. He persuaded her, which is yeah, the part that I still don't understand, persuaded her to take a little detour. Once they were on a detour, he brutally raped, uh, brutally attempted to rape her. It's unclear whether he did actually rape her. But he assaulted her, she lost consciousness, he ran back to the hotel and he said, I killed a girl, please call the police. The police came, he appeared in court the next day, and he was let out on his own recognizance. No mention was made of his previous conviction. So Mr. Kassir was out in the community, while members of the community, including his own mother, were really concerned about the safety of women in the surrounding area. So the friend of Carmichael went to the police officer, went to the prosecutor, and said to them, I understand and I see this guy around in our community. We are worried. What can you do about it? The prosecutor and the police officer said, nothing. He was out on his own recognizance. He was warned to appear in court on a certain date, but that's what constrained his movements, nothing else. No bail was set, and this is now you have to dig deep into Leo 31, because if you pay bail money, you can get to be let out, but you have to come back, and if you don't appear, you lose money. Warrants the arrest and all that. But if you let out on your own cognizance, you just have to take the responsibility. In the end, Katia agreed to go to Falkenberg Hospital for a 30-day observation. In respect of that other case, the one where he said you killed a girl and then went to bed, he um, went to Falkenberg Hospital. He came back because. With, did you even do it? When you are not fully competent and you are alleged to have committed a crime, I'm taking forms of calm shot for a moment. You're just doing a little bit of criminal. You appear in court, section 78, 79, or it's either 79, 80, 81, or 78, 77, 77, 78, 79, the Criminal Procedure Act, says that if it appears to the presiding officer that the person standing accused of a particular crime does not have the capacity to understand the proceedings and 
did not know what they were doing at the time of the commission of the crime, the person could be sent for observation to a mental hospital. Now, Fort England here in Grahamstown is probably the Eastern Cape's primary place where people are sent for observation. For those of you who didn't know, it's massive. And a lot of the work that they do relate to the criminal capacity of people. Now, the important thing here is Kutsia went by his own volition. He appeared in court and he said, can you check that I'm okay and I understand what I'm doing? <laughs> they went to, he went to Falkenburg, he came back from Falkenburg. The report said he is compass mentis and he knew what he was doing at the time of the commission of the act. But instead of arresting him and keeping him inside and setting bail, he was left out again on his recognizance, own recognizance. And that's when he attacked this commissioner. <laughs> so she went to court and she said, the police, the Minister of Safety and Security, and the Minister of Justice through the prosecutors, they failed in their duty to protect me. The very important thing, the register. Let's not disappoint people in this house and listen to us. So, were not developed to the point where one could say that in weighing up the responsibility to have the duty of care of a person that that actually amounts to the breach of that duty. So, here the court said, and the argument was that Section 72 respects, protects, promotes, and all. Section 39 2 requires us to interpret the common law in a manner that actually furthers the spirit of the person object of the Bill of Rights. So the first thing is that the court says is we need to look at the common law, and that's why I want you to go and read this case very, very carefully, so that you understand what the common law of dealing is in relation to the breach of a duty, and when you can claim damages. I know we study constitutional law, but we need to know what is the effect of constitutional law on the law of duty. Okay. So the court says that we follow two stages here. We say, does the common law reflect the constitutional standard? Does it, in other words, promote the spirit, purport, and object of the Bill of Rights? If it does not, how do we develop the common law to give effect to the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights? Does it reflect the standard of the common law? How do we give effect to, to it? 
to reflect the standard of the competition. And then the court goes on to say that there is an objective normative values framework that is embodied in the Constitution. And we have to look at this objective normative values framework and determine whether the common law reflects that objective normative values framework. That's paragraph 39 and 40. Now, here, the court says in paragraph 43, to determine whether there is a legal duty owed to someone, you have to find proportion, you have to engage in a proportionality exercise involving weighing up competing interests or considerations, and you to determine whether it is reasonable to place an, uh, an obligation on someone in the particular circumstance. So in this instance, the court says. Section 7.2, the state must respect, protect, promote people. There is an obligation. And the police officers and the prosecutors carry that obligation to protect women. So if we look at the determination of whether there is a duty and whether that duty was breached, we have to look at what is the constitution, what is the object of the the values framework say, or how does it impact on the proportionality exercise to determine whether there is a duty to act or not. And the court comes to the conclusion that the matter needs to be determined again by the High Court to determine whether there was um, a breach of the duty. To determine in the first instance whether there was a duty and to determine whether there was a breach of the duty. Now I can tell you, Commercial was attacked in Court after it's been in the Cape High Court, Supreme Court of Appeal in 2001. I think she was finally awarded damages in 2012. And Lucia came out of prison last year or the year before. Now, the wheels of justice don't turn very really fast. But Car Michelle's case is a landmark case in illustrating the impact of that objective normative values framework on how the law can be developed in line with the provisions of the Constitution. <coughs> now, and the nuance really is in how do we determine whether there is a duty and whether that duty is breached. The court says, now part of that determination of whether there is a duty and a determination of the duty to breach, we have to call the Constitution back. We no longer just look at it without any reference to the Constitution. Okay. Please go and read the case. I think we may have to go through it again because it is a really important case in cementing the, the approach to what do we do in relation to the common law to bring it in line with the common law.